Welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, the podcast that aims to demystify, explore, and provide a semblance of simplicity to the ever-evolving, complex, and FDA-approving world of medical oncology. Today, I am joined with my amazing host, Dr. Michael Fernando. How are you, Mikey? I'm good, Josh, and I like that. I like that semblance of simplicity. Um, I'm going to steal that one. Sounds good. So today, I have been tasked with the introduction to our episode before we talk about early stage lung cancer. It's a power that I give you very rarely, and I'm regretting it. I know. I love it. So here, this is how it goes, Mikey. In Breaking Bad, this is the TV show that was around, and it was this huge, huge (laughs) event for about five years. The first season was Walter White. Now, Walter White was this middle-aged chemistry teacher who was diagnosed with stage 3A lung cancer after surprisingly being symptomatic and coughing up some blood and some mild shortness of breath. Apart from all the challenges of managing the American healthcare system, there's so many other things that we can explore with him. So this includes why was he symptomatic? Because it was only stage 3A. A lot of people are asymptomatic. The psychological distress of him being diagnosed with cancer that led to his path of becoming a drug lord known as Heisenberg. We do not condone drug lords on this episode. No, they have no <laughs> efficacy. Methamphetamine has no efficacy in the treatment of lung cancer. That is, that, that is true. The other question that I had is, should he have had radiotherapy if he was cough, coughing up blood with such early stage lung cancer? I'm going to say probably. And how did he continue to manage to work two jobs throughout his treatment? And they never really explored the risk of his recurrence. But that's not where this ends, Mikey. And this is the harder question. What are the similarities that Walter White has to Jane Eyre, Edward Rochester, and, of course, Jesse Pinkman? I love this. I love this so much because Breaking Bad is one of my all-time favourite shows. I will correct you on one thing, Josh. They did actually address his uh, risk of recurrence in that in the final season, his cancer came back. Well, well, Oh, great. I have not seen the final season, so thank you for ruining that. McIntyre. Buddy, it's like 10 years old now. <laughs> yeah, I, I watch it with my dad, but since we don't live in the same state, we're kind of been like waiting anyway. But you haven't answered my second question with Jane Eyre, Edward Rochester. What do these guys all have in common, Michael? Well, I'm guessing they all had lung cancer. Well... I think Jane Eyre and Edward probably more likely to have tuberculosis based on, based on you know, the 1800s or, um, you know... That's a good point. That Kingdom. is a good point. <laughs> but what it really is, it's actually, you know, it's the relationship. So it's all about relationships, right? So, you know, Walter's relationship with his cancer, his family, with Jesse, you know, his ability to pay bills, maintain a semblance of normality. And I think you can see that in Jane Eyre's life as well. You know, she had a really rough upbringing, you know, the idea of being a woman who had ambition in a uh, bygone era was so difficult. You know, the her romance to her beloved Rochester, not originally sort of getting able to be with him and then finally being with him. Also, my wife's favourite book is Jane Eyre, so I'm butchering this part of it. But I think the trials and tribulations that we forget about with our patients is something that's really important with just everyone and everyone they interact with and within themselves and i think that that's human nature and that's medical oncology that we can all throw these drugs at them but it's all about those other things that are really important and the fewer drug lords in the world the better it is the 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 unspoken art of oncology that you have to have a and this is what makes it a fairly challenging specialty is is the breadth of skills that you really have to have to be a, a, a top of the line oncologist. You obviously have to have a head for numbers and statistics and statistical analysis so you can make a sense of the tsunami of uh, evidence that uh, you have to digest and and sift through. But you also do have to have, as you said, Josh, that human element um, so you can reach your patients, you can support them, and ideally uh, improve their quality of life while simultaneously stopping them becoming drug lords. 
Exactly. Which is, Ima- which is much less a problem in Australia, we must that's say. It. But imagine Jane Eyre, the drug lord, just saying, new season, that's, that's my pitch. <laughs> Breaking Jane. Um, let's move on. Mikey, do you want to talk to our lovely audience about early stage lung cancer? Yes, because that is actually what we're talking about. This is not a navel-gazing rumination on uh, the links between uh, different uh, figures in pop culture and how they're tenuously uh, linked to our chosen specialty of oncology. Um, We are talking about um, early-stage lung cancer, and it's not as common as some people might think. Everyone sort of knows in the public consciousness that lung cancer is one of the bad ones, not that there are really any good types of cancer, but, you know, there are types of cancer that you'd rather have. Um, But ask any oncologist or any oncology reg who's been practicing for a, a decent amount of time, and they will tell you that the number of times you see a patient present with early stage lung cancer that is completely resectable is very, very small. Which comes back to your point about Walter White, uh, Josh, is how did he have symptoms? And it is frequently sort of accidental. You know, the cancer is in the right spot, for example. The cancer is irritating or eroding through a bronchus. Um, So you get the uh, cough and the hemoptysis, which is so commonly associated with, um, with lung cancer, but actually presents in a small minority of cases. Um, Or as is frequently the case, a patient presents to have a scan for a completely unrelated reason. They've uh, had a trauma presentation to a hospital and they get a PAN scan and the radiologist is looking for broken bones and contusions and they see a spot in the lung and they say, hang on, what the hell is that? So it's frequently an accident that we find these patients because most of them are asymptomatic. Um, So the big thing with... uh, early stage lung cancer and why there is, I think, such a growing push into not just uh, finding better ways to screen for lung cancer. There's uh, increasing evidence behind uh, low-dose CT scans for screening and shows that it might actually improve early detection and outcomes. Uh, But the fact that even the earliest of early stage lung cancers carry a truly horrific risk of recurrence... So even in early stage disease, the recurrence risk is very, very high. Uh, In patients with stage 1B non-small cell lung cancer, the recurrence risk is approximately 25% within five years. And to give you a sense of what stage 1B is, that is a tumor size between three to four centimeters with no nodal involvement. And given the speed at which most of these cancers spread and metastasize, that is a very very lucky if you manage to pick one of those. Uh, As the tumours get bigger, the recurrence rates rates naturally get higher. So up to 76% of patients with stage 3 disease, and this is not necessarily stage 3B or 3C because those are generally not resectable because they've uh, involved the mediastinum, they've involved uh, contralateral lymph nodes, and it just gets too much anatomically, too complex and too morbid for any surgeon to attempt. So stage 3A lung cancers, up to 76% of them will recur or die after surgery. And this is regardless of post-operative chemotherapy. So even if you catch, it's not a case of like your colorectal cancers, your breast cancers, um, where we say you're so lucky to catch it early. We still say that, but it's it's with, with a little bit more of an air of pessimism because we know that there is a very high risk that even with all of the help that we can get, or all the help we can give these patients, they will almost certainly be back to see us in the future. Um, The standard of care, what we can do, so after a patient is referred to us, after they've had their lobectomy uh, or whatever um, surgical procedure they uh, require, um, is generally a cisplatin-based doublet chemotherapy generally given for four cycles after surgery. And it's usually a combination of either cisplatin and vinorelbine, if it's squamous cell, or cisplatin and pemetrexid, if it's adenocarcinoma. Um, These can be offered to patients with stage 1b to stage 3a. Stage 1b is a little bit uh, more controversial. Uh, The 
closest thing I could find to a consensus guideline was to offer it in patients with, quote, high-risk stage 1B, uh, which is tumours with uh, lymphovascular invasion, poor differentiation on histopathology, or a high SUV, that's, a, that's the degree of uptake that you see on a PET scan. And in stage 2 and stage 3A, it doesn't really matter what the cancer looks like, you just give it. But the reduction of uh, recurrence rates is very small with this chemotherapy. It's only associated with about a 16% decrease uh, of uh, disease recurrence or death. And if you look at certain places, by five years, the benefit is actually only 5%. So we're looking at giving chemotherapy for a very, very small benefit, a benefit that is smaller than the benefit we get from chemotherapy in pancreatic cancer or biliary cancer, all of those cancers where we say, you know, oh, this is really terrible... In the early lung cancer setting, it's possibly even worse. But the landscape is changing. And I think, Josh, you're going to uh, take the first step and illustrate to us today how our treatment vectors are um, shifting, as they are in so many types of cancer, from the adjuvant setting, so after surgery, to the neoadjuvant setting, which is before surgery. That's 100%. Correct, Michael. And just like Jane Eyre and her opportunities in modern day, I guess, society would be today, I think the same thing can be said about what's now happening with our treatment of early stage lung cancer. You're really jamming this Jane Eyre thing down our throats today. I know. I'm, I'm a classic at heart. Okay, Michael's took most of my fun facts about early stage lung cancer. They are Michael's fun facts, I can't, but... He's right. I guess (laughs) a couple of things just to further emphasize, only 25% of patients who have a lung cancer diagnosis up front are resectable. As Michael already mentioned, you know, the curative rate and recurrence isn't that high. At least 50% or more will recur and most will probably probably die at some point and this then adds the question how do we improve efficacy of treatment how do we reduce that risk of recurrence and this is where neoadjuvant treatment comes in and that's sweeping the field across all of the cancers you know sweeping the field across pancreatic although again you know that's a difficult one to actually cure breast cancer rectal cancer as well you know you can have rectal cancer is coming that's up yeah one um anything else michael those are the main ones. Um, I guess, you know, you have perioperative with um, gastro- gastric cancer right. and gastroesophageal cancer. Um, and there's also, you know, a push for neoadjuvant treatment in melanoma. As oh, well. And skin cancer, simiplumab as well from a skin cancer perspective. There's been some promising results. But I don't want to focus on that. Let's focus on early lung cancer because I've got a lot to talk through. But Josh, going... just before you do, could yeah, you just um, talk about like the rationale behind neoadjuvant treatment you can talk about it writ large but i guess focusing on lung cancer as well i would love to talk about the rationale so the rationale is this there's there's a correlation between getting a complete pathological response and improved outcomes so the theory is if you kill all the cancer cells before you take it out you're reducing the risk of that cancer coming back because my understanding of the the biology side of it is that you've got rid of all the cells so the likelihood that there are stray cancer cells still around even after surgery Unless the the rationale is that you're actually shrinking the size of the tumor. So you take a larger portion out, you're actually taking probably viable tissue, but you're also just taking all that cancer away. It might have actually been initially really difficult to remove. You're also, I think, just improving potential outcomes by doing this. In triple negative breast cancer space, they actually see huge benefits in this, which is a really aggressive cancer type. They've shown that it decreases the KI-67 or the reproductive rate of that cancer. And so I think that's really where this aim is. But they're taking this neoadjuvant treatment to the next level. They know that neoadjuvant chemotherapy alone in the in the lung cancer space still isn't that effective. But the question that they're asking is what happens if you add it with that legendary, that's so often forgotten to be talked about, immunotherapy so with this particular trial there was a phase two what a year and a half ago the phase three results have been released in may of this year through the new england journal of medicine but it's looking at the use of uh 
a chemotherapy in combination with nivolumab. Now, for those that are new to listening to our podcast, I'll quickly go through immunotherapy. The the, the, I guess the dummy version that I like is it activates your immune system and it teaches it how to kill those cancer cells, but it's a fully human anti-programmed death, uh, death ligand antibody. And it really restores the function of anti-tumor cells. And with the chemotherapy, it enhances the anti-tumor immunity through direct or indirect immune system activation. So you activate the immune system, you prime the cancer cells, you kill the cancer cells. Now, I previously presented the preliminary results of the phase two Checkmate 816, which is the trial I'll be talking about today. And it had some promising results, specifically looking at the complete pathological response, right, which is what they were looking for in that trial. And it was 24% versus 2.2%. Like, oh my gosh, Josh, that's incredible. It was a phase two trial, so there were a very limited number of patients um, I can't remember exactly the number, but I think it was you know, probably 18 to 20. And they weren't looking for overall survival at that time. Or well, they were, but there wasn't enough statistical evidence anyway. And they definitely found, I guess, in, information that led to them going for this phase three trial, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. A little bit of prior ongoing context is that they did look at that previous study and they said among patient, patients with a resectable stage 3a non-small cell lung cancer who received new adjuvant nimolumab and chemotherapy three-year overall survival and progression-free survival was 81.9 percent and 69.6 percent so already at that three-year mark 30 percent of those patients have relapsed that's what that is saying this trial was an open label meaning everyone knew what they were getting phase three, who would receive nivolumab 360 milligrams plus a platinum, thanks Mikey for introducing that, doublet chemotherapy, doublet meaning it's with another chemo, every three weeks, which I've never seen a three-weekly nivolumab regimen. Have you, Michael? No, not really. It's either two-weekly or four-weekly. Yeah, interesting, right? So I just wanted to highlight that particular stage. The surgery was planned to be done within six weeks of completion. So this is important to remember. If you leave it, and there is residual cancer cells, a lot of your treatment is potentially useless because if you wait six months to surgically remove this cancer, you might be back at the stage you're at and you're like, well, if I re-challenge you with nivolumab, is that even going to work? That's a question we don't know. So these patients were stage 1B to 3A and they had a good performance status, no prior treatment, no prior cancer, measurable disease, which makes sense. You can't stage someone if they don't have measurable disease. And if they'd had got a new, known mutation that was excluded, so this is ELK or the EGFR, which is the one you kind of want. I'm not going to have any spoiler alerts, but the Michael Fernando might be talking about one of those a little bit later. Interesting statistics to note, adjuvant chemotherapy was still received by 11% of those patients in the nivolumab plus chemotherapy arm and 22% of those in the chemotherapy arm alone. It wasn't in the trial, but I think it was an option to give. And I guess it's an unknown space. So it's unknown, meaning there's not a lot of data at the moment that if you gave neoadjuvant and adjuvant, would that eventually help? What were, what were they looking for? The primary endpoint? Event-free survival, meaning stuff didn't happen that was bad and pathological complete response and the secondary endpoint was overall survival you know when they say overall survival they're 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 gunning it means these guys know they've got they're onto something good and they're going to have a good outcome that's my my belief because most of the time if they're really worried or it's a really difficult cancer overall survival is usually not up there with respect to a couple of the demographics to talk about predominantly 60% were stage 3a within uh, within both arms they also stratified according to pdl1 level which is really important um, a lot of our cancers especially lung high pdl1 confers a greater response to immunotherapy it's a surrogate marker doesn't always correlate but it's pretty good I'm not sure if you said it Josh or if you're going to say it but what was the range of um cancer stages that they included given that it's a neoadjuvant stu- uh, an adjuvant trial neoadjuvant trial um did they accept patients with stage 3b or stage 3c 
No, so only stage 1B to stage 3A. Yeah, because that would be interesting um, if you could get like a stage 3B to a stage 3A and therefore make it resectable. And so what Maybe Michael... an area of further research. Yeah, well, Michael's inferring there that if you downstage them, potentially they then become surgically resectable. Which obviously would lead to a better outcome. Well, yes, that's our, our thing. So outcomes for this, a minimum follow-up was 21 months. The median, a median event-free survival was 31.6 months versus 20.8 months, which is good. So hazard ratio for disease progression, disease recurrence or death was 0.63. So that's almost 40% better in the intervention arm than the control arm. At the one-year mark, the estimated percentage of patients surviving without disease progression or disease recurrence, it is so confusing. So at the one year, if you're otherwise well and don't have cancer, it was 76% in the nivolumab arm and 63% in the chemo arm. So you can already see there's a bit of a divergence. And at the two years, they were 63 and 45%. So again, you're, you're essentially staving off this recurrence by at least a year which is interesting. On, ongoing from that, one of the other the aspects that we're looking at was pathological complete response. If you remember, I spoke about this earlier. It's where you kill all the viable cancer cells, you get better margins, you get clear margins. And what they saw was about 24% versus 2.2% in the intervention, the immunotherapy arm. So that's 10 times better. You know, odds ratio of 13.94, that's pretty good. And then you've got the forest plot, and I love forest plots because this is the sub-analysis of the different groups. And that's what you always want to know in oncology because not one rule doesn't fit every patient. So the question you ask here is like, if you've got a later stage disease, do you benefit better than an early stage disease? What about your age? What about your pdl one status? And what is interesting is is this most actually all subtypes really benefited from the intervention arm when you look at stage 3a they probably benefited a little bit more than the stage 1b and stage 2 which is almost in keeping with you've got a bit more of a larger cancer there's more tumor cells you can kind of see a better response i think i think you also see this in a lot of trials when you've got early stage cancer and you're looking for really strong benefit um, so that was something to note. When you look at the PDL1 status, when you break that down, everyone benefits. But my s- suspicion was correct that people that have greater than 1% or even greater than 50% did much better than the less than 1%. So the less than 1% PDL1, so that you don't have any, was that 14.1 months. And then if you go the greater than 50%, it was 40 months. Okay, so that's something that's just something that's interesting. Do you think that this will be a consideration in the future? Obviously, this is not entirely widespread in Australia at the moment, mainly because we can't get access to immunotherapy in this setting. But if slash when it is uh, available or it is an option, do you think that this will be a case where we uh, withhold or don't give immunotherapy to people without pdl one or do you think it's going to be much like what we do in metastatic gastric cancer where the data is that people without uh, significant pd1 uh, expression don't benefit but we still just give it to everybody so it's interesting that you say this michael i think they're probably going to offer it to everyone because they saw a benefit with the pathological complete response across the subtypes of pdl one and i think may maybe Maybe they'll say no for the less than 1%, but we know there's such a high risk of recurrence that it's, you're kind of bound to offer them this option. And unfortunately, the overall survival hasn't been reached in either arm, right? So it's not statistically significant. Despite the hazard ratio at the moment for death being 0.57, the P is also 0.08, but it's not at that pre-specified value. So that's sort of the statistics side. But I, I really do think you will see a benefit and I do think they will eventually offer it to everyone, much like the gastric cancer cohort. And one of the... Uh, 
sorry, one of the one of the other interesting things to talk, there's a lot to talk about this, Michael, in this trial. So there's a lot of gold nuggets is in patients without a pathological complete response. So people that did respond, but we didn't kill all the viable cells. The median event free survival was 20.6 months in the intervention versus 18.4 months. While it did, I guess, preference that of the intervention arm, it wasn't statistically significant. But again, maybe we have to wait longer to actually find out those results. It's also worth saying that it's not like we're comparing a neoadjuvant chemo plus IO with placebo. Patients are still getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy even in the control arm. That's um, it. So it's so the those sorts of narrow benefits are not, I guess, they're not outside the realms of possibility. It's not really a surprise. Um, no, it's it not, is not. interesting that we might be going down the route, the same route you mentioned it before with breast cancer, where we don't give adjuvant therapy to people with a, uh, a pathological complete response, but we do for people without it in an attempt to sort of clean up whatever was left behind. That That's exactly it, Michael. And we'll have to wait, I think, for ongoing analysis to look at overall survival. But so far, things are very much pointing towards the benefit of the intervention arm. One of the other things that is an exploratory endpoint, but it was analysis of CT DNA. And for those that don't know, CT DNA is essentially DNA in the bloodstream, the tumor markers, essentially from a, from a very basic Josh analysis. Uh, that's why I like to look at it. And they're looking at all these correlates to see if you have low CT DNA, is there reduced risk of recurrence? Are you having better responses? A lot of it's still in the exploratory investigative point, but it's nice to see that they're starting to bring this in. And what they found is that they found that the percentage of patients with CT DNA clearance was high in the nivolumab arm. So that was 50, 56%. Than those with the chemotherapy arm, which was 35%. Event-free survival also appeared longer in patients with CTDNA clearance than those without CTDNA clearance in both cohorts, right? So again, interesting that maybe one day we'll be able to use this for looking at response to treatment, looking at response to recurrence. When we're talking about safety and surgical complications, there was no delay in getting to surgery either the overall toxicities was higher actually in the chemotherapy arm alone versus the chemo plus nivolumab. And as we've mentioned previously, you have those autoimmune toxicities, which are slightly different to those chemotherapy ones. But generally, since it's so widely used now, especially in the lung field, people are quite good at managing them. Coming back to the um, the point you made about the CTDNA and the exploratory an analysis that is very interesting and a big part of this study from from what you're telling me from what you're telling me and our audience Josh is that it's not just looking at um, what the best treatment is it's looking and providing additional data on ways to identify the poor responders you know coming back to breast cancer we know the patients who don't have a pathological complete response to neoadjuvant therapy whether that's in the HER2 positive space or the the um, or the triple negative space, they tend to do worse. And that does, from from the results of this trial, appear to sort of follow a similar pattern in lung cancer. CTDNA, there's emerging evidence, uh, uh, a lot of it Australian, cue patriotic wa uh, flag waving and uh, hand on heart type thing. Um, but there's some emerging evidence about it being a marker, not just of sort of prognosis, but a, an indicator for... Uh, escalation of treatment in several GI cancers. Most recent, I think that the published data is mainly for, for rectal cancer. Um, but using that as a marker for lung cancer, not only to determine the effectiveness of treatment you've already had with the CTDNA clearance, but also using it to tailor additional treatment. But sorry, I, I did mean in sort of the adjuvant setting. So you have you have your CTDNA, you have your neoadjuvant, and then who knows if you if you clear your CTDNA after neoadjuvant treatment and resection, there might be a, a, a an evidence a burden of evidence to suggest that you don't need additional treatment and you just go into surveillance, which would be amazing.
realistically. I think, yeah, although, absolutely. again, the difficult, the downside to circulating tumor DNA also is that, as Michael said, if you want to escalate treatment and you don't have any escalation of treatment, are you just treating people without any potential benefit in the setting? And that's really difficult, especially if that's the best option you have to cure them. And that comes back to, you know, with these tests come great responsibility in the setting of how do you how do you manage that? How do you manage rationalizing giving someone chemo immuno if the CT DNA is still really high and you're like, well, we don't have anything else. Do you go straight to surgery in a lung cancer perspective? Do you keep going with the thought that maybe the we don't know everything about CT DNA, which obviously we don't. Oh, Michael does. I don't. And no, no. There's 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 a lot of holes in in these. Uh, uh, I guess future projections. Exactly, but they're future projections. But in the next five years, you know, liquid biopsy, CT DNA, that stuff is going to be at the forefront of our clinical practice. Well, I think what I might do, Mikey, is I'm going to hand the baton over to you. And I think if you want to talk about your trial, the Adora trial, not his personally, but he will be in analyzing this for us today. I am very excited to hear the results of his targeted therapy. Thank you, Josh. Gosh, I wish I was on the Adora trial. Um, so Josh's checkmate is, the, and the reason we decided to do checkmate first is it was a, a much more generally applicable uh, study uh, in that you could have any real type of tumour any, or any real type of lung cancer and you could potentially give them immunotherapy um, in the neoadjuvant setting, aiming for a resection. Uh, Adora caters to a much smaller cadre of patients, but it is incredibly impressive and very, very exciting. So... And I think we might have uh, mentioned and gone through Adora a bit in our ESMO uh, episode. Um, so if you haven't uh, um, uh, listened to that episode, you 100% should. But Adora was looking at patients with EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, specifically uh, non-small cell uh, adenocarcinoma, um, because there have been... There's historic evidence uh, for patients with squamous cell cancer. Number one, these sorts of targetable mutations don't occur nearly as frequently in squamous cell cancer. And number two, e, the targetable agents that we have generally aren't uh, as in nearly as effective. So very, very narrow focus of patients with adenocarcinoma of the lung with these EGFR mutations. And they are present in approximately 15% of uh, cases of advanced adenocarcinoma in the US. Um, but as anyone who's uh, done oncology or in, in Australia uh, studied for their physician's exams will know, um, the incidence is much higher in Asian populations. So the s- stereotypical uh, patient with an EGFR mutation is, Josh? You mean the young Asian female? Young Asian female, non-smoker. No one spoke. I forgot about that. Although, interestingly, there are other communities... I can't remember. There are other communities that aren't just the young Asian female cohort. Um, I think I Pacific Islanders are a, yes. another area um, or another a group of people who are uh, have a higher than average incidence of this. Now, it should be noted that when we say this sort of thing, we don't mean that if you have a old Caucasian heavy smoker patient with um, adenocarcinoma... Um, of the lung, you don't screen them for EGFR mutations and other targetable mutations such as Alkin ROS. You absolutely should because you will be surprised. Um, I've had a couple of those patients myself where I've done the test because it's available, it's cheap. Um, and I, But I've sort of said, oh, there's absolutely no way this guy's going to have a, um, a EGFR mutation and lo and behold, they do. And the reason for that is because it changes treatment so uh, significantly. We've talked about it in the metastatic setting with flora, but Adora, as the name suggests, is adjuvant. So adjuvant osimertinib in the EGFR mutant space. It's it's almost when we're trying to pick patients with EGFR or ELK mutations, I I like to refer to the same as, you know, you're the ED doc and you get called for someone that might have a stroke. The number of times you're like, this can't be a stroke or this is definitely a stroke. 
you get there's so many occasions you're like well i i was wrong you know i got that ct it showed me a very convincing ischemic infarct or a hemorrhagic infarct or usually ischemic because they present weirdly and you're just like oh, i just didn't pick it and i think it's really the same you just do it for everyone and if you don't do it you're doing a disservice not testing them for the egfr or those mutations absolutely absolutely and i guess that uh, the other thing is back in the day and i've heard stories about people um uh, oncologists who had a a a ream of stickers for the egfr test that the uh the, that the company would pay for and once you used up all your stickers your like authorization stickers you couldn't get any more um and the test was hundreds thousands of dollars back in the day but now it's it's very cheap and routinely done so there's really no downside to testing if it's negative that's fine you move on but if it's positive, it really does change things. And we know this, again, in the metastatic setting, but there is emerging evidence in the adjuvant setting, the effect is no less significant. So ADORA was a study of almost 700 patients, 682 patients, who were randomized one-to-one to receive osimertinib or a matching placebo. And I know what some of our listeners are probably thinking, why weren't they comparing it with adjuvant therapy? Um, well, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One, as we've said, adjuvant therapy by itself is probably not very effective at all. So you could... It's terrible. It's not just not effective. I mean, <laughs> if in breast cancer, you'd probably still give it, but we know that it doesn't really change the recurrence rates a lot. So it's not a good comparator. <laughs> you're absolutely right. So um, if you're a cynical man, you might say um, even... Uh, even though they're giving, even if they did give adjuvant chemotherapy, they may as well have been giving placebo, hardy, hardy, ha. Um, but the other thing is that for a lot of these patients, they actually did allow for them to have adjuvant chemotherapy um, prior to starting osimertinib. So you could have um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and you're able to uh, start your treatment within 26 weeks to allow for you to get your four cycles of adjuvant chemo. If you didn't have adjuvant chemotherapy, and I believe it was sort of a clinician decision, um, you were randomized within 10 weeks of your original surgery. Uh, Patients uh, had to be ECOG 0 to 1, as is standard for these sorts of patients. They enrolled patients very similar to uh, Josh's Checkmate study. They uh, enrolled patients with stage 1B to 3A cancer. And they had to have had a complete resection with negative margin. So Josh was talking about the neoadjuvant sphere. Uh, here we actually have data in, in the form of a pathological specimen to see how, or to confirm that the resection is complete. Patients were stratified by, by disease stage, uh, the actual type of EGFR mutation. So it's worth noting that there are three, mo- three common types of EGFR mutation, exon 19 deletions. Uh, exon 20 deletions and insertions, I believe, as well, and the L858R um, translocation on exon 21. So exon 20 famously is the middle child which doesn't really respond to uh, targeted EGFR inhibitors, so those, they were excluded. So only patients with exon 19 or exon 21 mutations were included in the study. Patients were also stratified to uh, race, so Asian versus non-Asian. I think a significant proportion of um, these patients came from Japan and China as well. The planned treatment duration was three years or until disease recurrence. And they chose three years based on the observational data that the majority of relapses occur in the first three years. Um, Although this will become important uh, later as we actually look at the data. Uh, The primary endpoint was disease-free survival in patients with stage 2 to 3A disease. Those are the patients that they figured are more likely to gain a benefit. Um, Secondary endpoints were disease uh, in patients in the intention-to-treat population, so any stage. Overall survival, which, spoiler alert, is still immature, and safety. In terms of the demographics, this is actually quite interesting because it flies in the face of a lot of demographics that you would normally see in a lung cancer trial. So uh, 70% of the patients across both groups were female, 64% of the patients were Asian, and uh, between 68 and 75% of patients in both groups were never smokers. So you do have a lot of patients who 
wouldn't normally be included in these trials, but I guess that's the point. These are the patients who don't meet the stereotypical lung cancer patient uh, phenotype, shall we say. Uh, the disease stages, uh, patients were evenly split across stage 1B, stage 2 and stage 3A. Uh, 55% had exon 19 deletions and 45% had the L858R um, translocation. 60% of patients in both groups had adjuvant chemotherapy as well. So uh, 60% uh, of these people are getting as basically as much therapy as we can give. So in terms of the results, so... Buckle up because we've got some very impressive hazard ratios coming up. Uh, so 66% of patients in the osimertinib group completed their three years compared to 41% of placebo. But what's interesting about this, and I might have mentioned this in our uh, previous episode, is that the median duration of response in the osimertinib group was 35.8 months when the maximum they could get is 36 months, three years. So it... Even though 66% of uh, patients, only 66% of patients are completing their treatment, it really does seem like the majority were getting close. The duration of exposure in the placebo group, for what it's worth, was 25.1 months. The initial interim analysis demonstrated an 83% reduction in the risk of death uh, or recurrence with uh, osimertinib in stage 2 to 3A disease. With a hazard ratio, Josh, what do you reckon the hazard ratio is? I don't know if I should guess this, Michael. I actually have the trial up ahead of me, um, and I, I know oh, it has a spoil ratio. Spoil it. <laughs> spoil it. It's really, really good, but I'll let you say It's it. really good. It's 0.17, which I cannot think of a better hazard ratio in all of oncological research. Can you think of a better one? To date. I mean, I would love a 0.16, but yes, published research, there's, there's not a lot, nothing really that matches that. Absolutely. The um, overall population did lag slightly behind with a 70% reduction in the risk of recurrence or death. Um, So obviously it stands to reason, and we said this right at the start, is that patients with higher risk disease are going to benefit from additional therapy. So if you take out the uh, stage 1Bs, who might not ever have recurred anyway, the benefit is going to be less. Uh, the disease-free survival was prolonged with osimertinibs across all subgroups, including those who received prior adjuvant chemotherapy. But uh, as of ESMO this year, there were some updated results. Still don't have overall survival data yet, which for a lung cancer trial in itself is notable because obviously uh, when you have immature data, that means you are waiting for people to, to, to have enough events to make those calculations. And the fact that we're not there yet is fantastic. But the disease-free survival in stage 2 to 3A group was 65.8 months versus 21.9 months with a hazard ratio of 0.23. So not quite 0.17s, but still bloody good for lung cancer. When it's broken down, though, you can see this pattern of higher risk disease meets increasing benefit. So the stage, the hazard ratio for stage uh, 1B was 0.41. Stage 2 was 0.34 and stage 3A was 0.2. So increasing benefit with worse disease. If you look at the curves, though, the curves for patients with stage 2 and stage 3A disease appear to drop quite precipitously after three years, which, of course, is where the treatment was stopped. So there's a question about whether there needs to be a little bit of tweaking around how long we give these patients osimertinib. Uh, because pot- there is a potential that uh, you're having a rush of recurrences. And we don't know whether these would or would not have happened, whether osimertinib is just uh, active and effective for this long and the cancer develops mutations uh, that uh, confer a resistance to osimertinib. We don't know why. But the question is, are we withdrawing osimertinib a little bit too early? It's far too early to tell, but there is there are these questions floating around. Michael, I, I love that you brought that up, and that's something that I think is really, really interesting. Because on one point, is there a flare? Is it sort of that that's it, just the ones that you know the ones that you've been holding at bay when you take away the osimertinib? Do they become sort of hyperactive and just really go to town on exploding with their cancer? The second question I have, and I don't know if you're going to bring this up, is that those that complete treatment and then recur because they've technically never progressed on treatment, can you just restart the osimertinib? Well, I guess that would be the thought. 
Um, and I guess the other thing is, if they have recurred, then presumably they are now metastatic. Um, which, you know, in terms of the sites of recurrence, lung was the most common site. So if you have an isolated uh, lung recurrence, there's still the option for uh, radical radiotherapy, uh, additional surgical resections, all that sort of stuff if the patient is fit for it. But then you have uh, recurrences in the lymph nodes, recurrences in the CNS, which is obviously very concerning if cancer is uh, fleeing to the CNS as a sanctuary site which we know is a phenomenon in in a lot of cancers, not just lung. Uh, and then you have recurrences in the bones. Those are the four most common areas of recurrence in this study. And in really three out of those four, in, in most of those cases, in three out of four of those sites, the patient is not going to be uh, resectable, so they're going to effectively be metastatic. So it would stand to reason that you would then start restart osimertinib um, provided they hadn't recurred either on treatment or immediately after, you know, because if you recur in those three to six months after the cancer, uh, after you've stopped osimertinib, then it is much less likely that restarting it is going to have an effect. Looking at the subgroup uh, analysis for Adora, the uh, subgroup analysis, the, the forest plots are very much shifted to the left. So Across the board, there is a benefit for uh, osimertinib over placebo in these patients. So we have to nitpick, though. We can't just sort of say, "Hey, it's great and everything is and everything is great and everyone's going to do really well." So the benefit we mentioned may be less in stage one B cancers, and that doesn't necessarily mean patients do worse. It's important saying that. It's just that there is a lesser magnitude of benefit compared to giving osimertinib with placebo. So patients still are doing very well. And if you look at the survival curves, they're, they're definitely flattest in patients with stage 1B disease. But the separation of the curves is narrowest because the osimertinib is doing less heavy lifting. And so you can get away, or more people can get away with just receiving a sugar tablet. Interestingly, patients uh, who were L858 are uh, mutant, uh, also appeared to benefit less with a hazard ratio of 0.5. And patients who did not receive adjuvant chemotherapy appeared to benefit less with a hazard ratio of 0.36. So again, the patients who did not receive adjuvant therapy, that might also correlate to the patients who were stage 1B. And so it might be a case of they're doing well without osimertinib or without adjuvant therapy. But the L858R mutation showing a little bit more resistance is interesting, and I am nowhere near smart enough to tell you why. I think this also comes, sorry, Marky, when it comes to resistance, what we know about the mutation pathways is that, you know, we're blocking all these cancers at certain sites, but they're, they're cascades. So there's not a single point, really. And when resistance occurs, it's because at some other point, in that cascade of markers and, I guess, onco oncogenes, etc., that produce aberrant cancer cells, that's changed and it no longer works or it works downstream to the target site that you're affecting. So maybe there's something to do with the way it binds to the site and the L858R EGFR mutation. I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, the poster child for resistant genes was the T790M, which until a couple of years ago, uh, was the only way you could get osimertinib in Australia. Patients had to progress on an older drug like allotinib or gefitinib, and then you had to do another biopsy. You had to determine whether they had this T790M resistance mutation, mm. and then only then you could get osimertinib, whereas now, obviously, that's not the case. You can just get it in the first line. Yeah. What other, what other nitpicking things did you find, Mikey? I love when we break down these trials. <laughs> break them down and then build them back up again. Exactly. Those those were the main ones. I think most of the uh, subgroups were clustered around that 0.25 to 0.35 hazard ratio mark. So, and and it's important to notice we are nitpicking. We're complaining about a difference of 0 0.05 in a hazard ratio when every single um, pre-specified subgroup that was looked at in this trial had a hazard ratio of less than 0.5, which is just incredible. But um, I guess the only other nitpick would be just the adverse events. Obviously, there were more adverse events in the osimertinib group compared to the placebo group, which it would be strange if that wasn't the case. The most common 
Adverse events were diarrhea, paronychia, and dry skin. But there are a couple of uh, adverse events, I guess, of special interest with osimertinib. Josh, do you know what those are? No, tell me. They are um, interstitial lung disease, which is a, a significant reason why uh, patients who are on your trial, Josh, Checkmate uh, 816, probably wouldn't have been enrolled in this trial because there is a, a link between giving immunotherapy and then giving osimertinib, which is why in a lot of centres, if you have a patient, and we're, we're sort of flipping to the metastatic setting now, but if you have a patient who you're waiting for the uh, genetic testing uh to come back on your uh, lung cancer patient and you need to get them started on treatment or they're very keen to start treatment, you generally withhold the immunotherapy until you confirm that they don't have a sensitizing mutation. Because if you give them immunotherapy and then give them uh, a targeted agent such as uh, osimertinib, obviously, but electinib, those sorts of things, you are increasing their risk of developing a uh, interstitial lung disease or a pneumonitis type picture. Actually, I did know that. You, yes, I, I knew you did, Josh. I knew you did. I was like, what? I do know this. Yeah, that, that's the whole reason you've always got to make sure. But also, yeah, the treatment's a great treatment. Absolutely. The other one, which I must admit I didn't know until I looked at it, is um, QT prolongation, which was present in mm-hmm. 9% of patients getting osimertinib. So they're still rare, but they are important to know. So in conclusion, uh, talking about Adora, there is uh, a, a very significant benefit in disease-free survival with adjuvant osimertinib with, uh, as they say in these, uh, in these presentations, very robust hazard ratios. Uh, there's no overall survival data yet. I suspect we'll be waiting a year or two before we get those data actually read out. And it will be interesting because there have been a couple of cases uh, where there's been great progression-free survival data And then it comes to read out the overall survival data and there is just no difference. And I think that if that's going to happen with any cancer because of the horrific recurrence rates, it's going to be lung cancer. So it'll be very interested to see what the overall survival is. Um, There's a tolerable side effect profile, but again, there's this question of how long do these patients need to be on osimertinib? Do they need to be on it for five years? Do they need to be on it for 10 years? I suspect... And again, we're drawing a lot of parallels to breast cancer, but I I guess breast cancer is the er example of uh, these sorts of approaches. And I do wonder Mm. whether there will be a, much like we have with endocrine therapy in breast cancer, whether it'll be a, you had stage 3A um, lung cancer resected, uh, you had lymphovascular invasion, your differentiation was poor, we're going to put you on osimertinib for seven years or 10 years. Whereas if you had stage 1A cancer um, uh, with none of those high-risk features, we're going to put you on it for three years. And I do wonder if there's going to be a little bit of a little bit more finesse to our approach. And I think that's what it all comes down to, Michael. It's choosing the right treatment for the right person. And you're right, if a person needs seven years of treatment, then give them seven years. And if it doesn't cause them any problems, you know, no harm, no foul. Absolutely. And again, I think it is... If you're in a bit of a reflective mood, it is important to step back and sort of say, well, we are talking about seven years for lung cancer, which would be, which would have just been just inconceivable, to quote Wallace Shawn from The Princess Bride, um, just inconceivable about 10 or 20 years ago to have lung cancer and then survive for any, any duration of time. Uh, so it is incredible where this sort of stuff is headed. Exactly. Hey, Mikey, did you want to do, do the wrap up? I think I will. So in summary, uh, there is a, a, a growing movement towards a neoadjuvant um, a treatment in uh, non-small cell lung cancer. As is ever the case with a new, uh, a new treatment modality, it involves immunotherapy. And the early signs are good with a, uh, increasing, uh, an improved event-free survival and pathological complete response rate. However, we do need to, uh, to wait a little bit of time for these results to come out. And with Adora, you might say that we adore the results in that the hazard ratio is very, very good in disease-free survival. So good that we haven't actually got overall survival data yet, but again, there might be a little bit of finesse yet to come. And Michael, we always adore your terrible jokes. 
Yeah, well, I mean, both of our terrible jokes, Josh. That's part of the selling point for this podcast. It is the selling point. And as always, thank you for tuning in. If you would like us to review a certain trial, feel free to drop us an email at inquisitiveonk at gmail.com. Rate us, subscribe, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that we are the one who knocks. Take care. Bye.